Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us for the 2022 Malkincraft Lecture. I'd like to welcome Dr. Raymond Parsons to give this lecture, but before, before he does, we'll hear Dr. Uh, before, uh, let me turn it over to our Cancer Center Director, Leo Pete, Leon Petenius, who wants to say a few words about this named lectureship. Leon? So thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, this lectureship is um, in honor of the Malkin family and the Kraft family. And uh, these families who are supporters of the Cancer Center for a long time have uh, paid special attention to education. They have supported a lot of our educational scholarships, programs, and then they established this talk where we invite uh, once a year very distinguished uh, speakers whose work has a uh, high impact in the field of cancer biology. And uh, I'm really grateful today that we have here uh, Dr. Amon Parsons, who is the uh, director of the TIS uh, Cancer Institute of Mount Sinai, New York, and I wanna thank you. And I'm gonna pass it back to Marcus, who is gonna introduce uh, Dr. Parsons. Thank you, Leon. Um, as uh, Leon mentioned, Raymond Parsons today is our speaker and he's the director of the Tisch Cancer Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and holds the Ward Coleman Chair in Cancer Research. He's also the director of Mount Sinai Cancer, Mount Sinai Health System and Chair of the Department of Oncological Sciences at the Icon School of Medicine. Dr. Parsons has received multiple awards for his research, including the 2011 AACR Outstanding Investigator Award for Breast Cancer Research and a 2017 NCI Outstanding Investigator Award. He is internationally recognized as an expert in the fields of cancer genetics and signal transduction with an emphasis on the tumor suppressor gene P10. And the title of his talk today is Improved Targeting of Cancers with Mutations in the PR3 Kinase P10 Pathway. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Raymond. And to the audience, as usual, please ask your questions in the chat box. We will get to them at the end of the presentation. Raymond, take it away. Well, thank you very much for that really warm introduction, Marcus and, and Leon. Uh, very, thank you. Thank you for having me here. So let me just go to um, share my screen. Okay. All right. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, just get started here. Well, thank you for coming uh, virtually. And uh, just uh, this is a, a first slide here just shows you um, a, a map of Manhattan and the Mount Sinai Medical Center where we're located is right on the Upper East Side of, of New York City. And if anybody's looking for a postdoc um, in New York City, uh, please reach out to me where I'm actively recruiting uh, uh, for my lab. And um, also if there's anybody else you'd like to work with uh, at the Icon School of Medicine, let me know and I can uh, help make contact for you. Um, anyway, so to... Uh, Get started. I just, uh, you know, I, um, I, I kind of like history. <laughs> always have been a bit of a history buff, so I always like to tell the story from a historical perspective. So, um, we've been um, working on um, P10 really from the beginning, uh, and uh, identified this gene as a tumor suppressor back in 1997 by virtue of a um, screen for homozygous deletions that occurred in in tumors, and we were lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and identify a probe. Uh, let me just put on my, um, uh, my laser pointer. Um, a, we, we identified a probe uh, right here that just happened to be um, within the, the, the locus of the P10 gene, uh, which, uh, and then uh, by positional cloning mapped the gene out and found that uh, there were homozygous deletions in a, many different kinds of cancer. Uh, that we were looking at both in uh, uh, mostly cell lines, but also in, in PDX models and also in primary tumors uh, that uh, was, was the first uh, um, clue that there might be a tumor suppressor here. Uh, we then identified a, a coding region and we called it P10 because it had a phosphatase domain and it was on, um, it was homologous also to a gene called tensin and it was on chromosome 10. And we showed early on uh, as did Peter Steck's group independently, uh, who was at uh, MD Anderson and, and called the gene MMAC1, um, uh, showed it was mutated in um, a, a variety of different kinds of cancers by looking at frame shift mutations, missense mutations, nonsense mutations, et cetera. Uh, and then um, uh, 
then we, uh, working with Karis Eng, uh, who is at Cleveland Clinic, found that P10 mutations in the germline are, are associated with uh, uh, hamartoma syndromes. Uh, it's called Cowden's disease, but also um, uh, autism and macrocephaly. And then um, uh, it, we, uh, we showed that it was a protein phosphatase early on and uh, uh, others of our colleagues, uh, are, uh, more insightful biochemists than I am, uh, figured out it was a, um, a, a lipid phosphatase. And here's the domain structure of P10 as a phosphatase domain, a C2 domain, a tail domain, and a PDZ binding domain. Uh, so the, uh, um, the other thing I just wanted to point out is um, that P10 uh, long is an isoform of P10 that we identified now about eight years ago. Uh, and it is a, um, it's, there's a transcript that makes P10. And also there's an alternative translation a site here in the same transcript that can make a longer form of P10 that we call P10 long or P10L. And it has uh, the same domain structure as regular P10 shown here, but it has this unique region at the amino terminus that includes a, a secretion signal and a polybasic region uh, that's, uh, uh, so the secretion signal allows for secretion of P10 along and also this polybasic region that allows for um, uh, entry of the protein into cells uh, through, uh, through uh, penetration of the plasma membrane. Uh, the functions of P10 are pretty, uh, pretty well known to be on a, a, you know, a lipid phosphatase of, uh, of the P3 kinase pathway. I think that's a very, very strong data, uh, genetic data, biochemical data, um, uh, model system data shows that this is a really the primordial function of P10 that can be seen uh, back to um, C. elegans, uh, uh, and that these, these genes, uh, regular P3 kinase, P10, AKT, uh, PDK1, et cetera, on this pathway are really preserved and they're involved in regulation of a variety of different um, processes in the cell, uh, but many have to do with uh, the cell cycle of uh, growth and a uh, cell death. And, uh, and in addition, P10 has some sort of non-canonical functions. Um, it, it's known to be able to function in the nucleus. It's known uh, to inhibit migration uh, through phosphatase independent mechanisms. Uh, and uh, P10 has been shown to interact with a lot of different proteins. It's quite sticky. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot in the literature, I think, that is uh, really interesting and compelling, but also some of it may be, you know, some false leads uh, as, as one also has in any, in any field. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, here you can see, um, this is a paper in 1998 that really documented that P10 was a lipid phosphatase. This was a key key finding cementing P10 to the insulin signaling uh, pathway. And uh, back in those days, we were very interested in making sure that that was the case uh, in tumor cells. And we showed that it could inhibit uh, PIP3 production P10 uh, in cells, and that also uh, we could induce cell death uh, when we added P10 to tumor cells uh, uh, versus phosphatase dead. Uh, and that this was at least in part due to um, apoptosis through this ZVAD experiment. We also showed uh, back in the last century that P10 could lower AKT phosphorylation in cells and also could rescue cells uh, from uh, cell death induced by uh, P10 uh, using meristillated AKT. Uh, also, we saw this with a BCL2, in fact. Um, and then we also in parallel uh, made mice that were mutated for P10 um, in the germline and uh, homozygous were null and uh, null mice were uh, not viable, but heterozygous mice got tumors uh, throughout their organs, uh, many, many different uh, benign uh, tumors um, in these mice. Um, uh, and then occasionally they become uh, malignant on their own. Uh, and this is kind of the phenotype that we found with our mouse. This was also work uh, done by TAC Max group and Pier Paolo Pandolfi's group uh, also generated similar mice at the same time and saw sim similar things. We, we sort of had different phenotypes. There's so many phenotypes. We were reporting uh, uh, some overlap and some unique things, um, but I think they were all uh, overall uh, accurate. Uh, um, and, and one of the things that was very interesting about the tumors 
uh, even the benign ones, and this is one in a, a, a small lesion in the prostate, is they were associated with um, upregulation of AKT phosphorylation, really showing that this pathway was truly activated in the setting of tumor suppressor inactivation. And this was also associated with increased proliferation. So anyway, so I'm gonna sort of cut out a lot of years of, of research here and just sort of fast forward to 2017. I wanna tell a little story about P53 that I think is really interesting uh, before I get into the main uh, topic uh, of, of, of the talk, which is um, uh, on AKT uh, targeting uh, and uh, uh, showing e efficacy, as, which is reflected in the title of my talk. Uh, but, but basically, uh, early on, uh, we were doing a lot of profiling of our own uh, um, pre-TCGA uh, uh, days where we had our own collection and we were trying to annotate it and figure it out. So this data is uh, quite quite old here, much earlier than 2017. But we've noticed uh, a, a, an interesting correlation between uh, P53 mutation shown here in green um, uh, uh, and what we saw was P10 mRNA expression and uh, P10 signature, which is a gene expression signature for loss of P10. And we wanted to <clears throat> understand a little bit more about, um, and, and also P10 protein lowering. Uh, uh, and we wanted to understand you know, what was going on. So we, we basically went and, and got a, some tumors and we did QRT-PCR for P10 uh, based on the P53 status. Uh, this is all breast cancer. And we saw we could reconfirm this original finding that was found by microarray. And so, you know, we, we thought it would be really interesting that maybe P53 could regulate a P10 and uh, maybe even other um, important genes uh, at the baseline under the, uh, the conditions of, of uh, uh, physiologic conditions or low stress conditions found in the body. Obviously, everything in our body is under some kind of stress. So P53 may be responding at some level, but this is not the kind of stress we typically think of where we're activating P53 with, let's say, DNA damaging agents, um, and, 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 and therefore being able to see this uh, activity of P53 in, you know, just in, in, in tumor tissue. Uh, so to look into this, we uh, did a P53 ChIP-seq and MCF10A, which is a immortal non-transformed uh, wild type P53 mammary epithelial cell line. And uh, we found a, a peak um, uh, that had not been identified before of binding of P53. Um, prior work had shown that there was a P53 binding, I mean, uh, 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 P53 binding to the P10 promoter here, shown here on the right. Uh, and there's a little peak there uh, upon radiation activation. But this was here in just normally cultured cells and, and what potentially could have been an enhancer. Um, and, ended, and, and we ended up showing that it was, in fact, a, a re, helped to regulate the expression of P10 and an enhancer for P10. But what we also found was startlingly uh, at the time was that several other tumor suppressors, and here too, um, were also bound constitutively uh, in the MCF10A model. And then we found some public data that, from a published data set on U2S, another cell line uh, that has wild type P53 and is often used as a model for P53 function, also human. And we found the same peak for P10, uh, STK11 and UTX, uh, well-validated uh, tumor suppressor genes. And here uh, we looked at all the peaks and, and annotated them for tumor suppressors. And we found about a dozen um, tumor suppressors that were enriched in, um, in the peaks uh, from ChIP-seq for P53 uh, and, and just under uh, steady state conditions, un, un, unstressed. Uh, obviously there's always some stress. Uh, and then here we saw it with U2S and so they, they fairly well lined up uh, with each other um, uh, with some, you know, moving around, but uh, clearly uh, uh, these were there. And, you know, I draw your attention to these being all uh, validated tumor suppressors in the sense that if they're made mutant in the mouse, they, um, they uh, cause some type of overgrowth phenotype. And then when we wanted to see if this was something uh, sort of to, to do this sort of in an agnostic manner, we, we, we took an annotated list of tumor suppressors from the cosmic, 
database and an annotated list of oncogenes from COSMIC and asked whether there was truly enrichment by gene set enrichment analysis. And, and we found that there was enrichment for tumor suppressors uh, in the targets, the basal targets for um, P53 in, in these two cell lines. And we then asked, um, what are these peaks of uh, P53 binding to? And we found that they were basically looking just like the consensus sequence uh, uh, for P53 binding. Um, they were classic binding sites. Um, and you can see uh, here um, uh, the, the, the consensus sequence. And you can see the, the, the binding sites when they're in black, that's really following the consensus with some exceptions, which is uh, occurs for P53 um, uh, as well, uh, for, uh, outside of these rules for, for binding. And um, uh, we then did RNAi experiments on MCF10A to see if potentially lowering P53 could ex affect the expression of these genes. And this was seen in, in, in all the cases that we tested here. Uh, and was also uh, detectable at the protein level. Uh, and interestingly, um, we made this point in the paper by Kiri Pappas, who was the, who was the first author on this uh, paper, did a terrific job, um, and is currently um, uh, studying prostate cancer uh, at MSK uh, as a postdoc in Charles Sawyer's lab. But she, uh, she noted that several of these tumor suppressors that, P10, that uh, P53 is binding to, are haploinsufficient tumor suppressors in mice, meaning that simply changing the dose level of these tumor suppressors in mice by one copy can promote tumor uh, progression or initiation. And uh, so this is really interesting from the point of view of how does P53 function as a tumor suppressor, potentially mutating it has this haploinsufficient effect on a, a variety of other target genes, um, uh, not simply through the, 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 the canonical uh, P53 pathway that we all know and love. And then we asked uh, in a pan cancer, we worked with Raul Rabadon, a bioinformaticist at Columbia, to ask in a, in a pan cancer analysis of, we selected four of these target genes for this deep dive. And three of them showed really strong relationships uh, between uh, basically the P53 mutation. What this chart's showing you is that um, P53 mutation increases the odds of basal uh, P53 uh, target downregulation of these tumor suppressors. So, uh, and the level of significance is indicated. Um, so the, the odds of downregulation, uh, you know, uh, are uh, going up here uh, from zero up. So you see the trend for most of the cancers is above zero, which would be expected. And, the, and for many of these different cancer types shown here on the bottom, uh, these differences are significant, um, uh, statistically significant. Uh, and very strongly, uh, not only uh, for P10, but also for PHLDA3 and also for TNFRSF10B. Um, I just you know, would feel remiss if I didn't bring up this uh, important finding. So uh, in 2005, we, we, we sequenced 344 women's breast cancers. And what we found was that um, uh, PIK3CA mutations uh, um, occurred very commonly in breast cancer. In fact, it's the most common uh, uh, mutated gene uh, in, in, um, in breast cancer, uh, particularly in the ER positive subset of breast cancer. Uh, and uh, you can see here um, that um, uh, mutations seem to cluster in these hotspots. This uh, originally was identified uh, in, uh, by Victor Valcolescu at Johns Hopkins in colon cancer. Uh, and then we quickly jumped on that and published this paper as did many other groups who um, uh, similarly were interested in this um, at the time. Uh, and we also made mice that um, with uh, uh, that activate uh, the, one of the major hotspots, uh, 1047R. We also did uh, E545K as well, uh, working uh, uh, in collaboration uh, with others at, at Columbia, uh, including Arjif Stratiatis. And, and what we found was that um, these uh, these um, uh, these mice uh, basically get really a very very poor tumor development, uh, which we could hasten a lot with estrogen pellets. And since these are uh, these the typical mutation occurs in um, in uh, um, ER positive breast cancer, that was the reason why we we added the estrogen pellets. Uh, 
And what was also interesting is the ER positivity of the tumors, which tend to be negative um, uh, normally, but when we add the pellet, they convert to ER positive tumors. So we, we generated this model and actually have, this is a later paper. We, we published prior papers uh, with, this, um, uh, with this model, uh, but I, I'm really proud of this because you know, we're trying to replicate. And, and, and in this paper, uh, which we published in Oncogene, we, we identified cell lines from this model and then identified one that we could plant, transplant uh, uh, syngenaically um, and then did some experiments to identify uh, therapies that could overcome resistant to hormone therapy, which was a feature of, of many of these uh, tumors. Anyway, so now I'm going to get to the main course of today's, uh, of, of today's lecture, uh, and that is to focus on uh, trying to develop uh, an AKT to greater uh, that can improve upon the efficacy of AKT inhibitors. Uh, and I just uh, bring up this abstract. It was one of the early abstracts uh, seeing a signal uh, that uh, could demonstrate that there could be a benefit to treating, in this case, a pro metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer with uh, a patacertib. Uh, AKT kinase inhibitor. This was one of the first abstracts and uh, that, that seemed to see a signal. Now, uh, since this time, it, it seems, and I may, I may be wrong on this, but my understanding is um, uh, the, these drugs, um, these kinase inhibitors um, have not really proceeded as well in the clinic as we would have liked, partly because of a uh, you know, mix, mixture of um, lack of efficacy and, and some toxicity but mostly I think uh, because um, not everybody responds that is supposed to in this setting um, and the responses aren't so great. But anyway, there was a signal there. And, and in this case, it, this was um, uh, Dr. DeBono who was stating that this was the first clinical demonstration supporting P10 loss as a predictive uh, response biomarker for uh, this, this disease. Um, anyway, so based on some of those early uh, work and, and the development of, of PROTAC or proteolysis targeting chimeric molecules. Um, we started working in collaboration with John Jin here, uh, who is a medicinal chemist uh, at, um, at our institution here at the Tisch Cancer Institute and uh, at Mount Sinai. And what, we've, what, the, what the, the purpose was here with the PROTAC, for those of you who aren't familiar, is it's basically a chimera that has one component here on the right that um, binds with high affinity to your protein of interest that you wanna degrade. And another um, component or molecule that's tethered uh, with this um, molecular rope um, to uh, a ligand that can bind to a ubiquitin ligase. And interestingly, uh, this, uh, this tethering of these two uh, small molecules and bringing these two proteins in close proximity is sufficient to ubiquitinate and polyubiquitinate the protein of interest and target it for proteasome uh, mediated destruction. In our case, uh, we screened a variety of AKT kinase uh, inhibitors uh, for the, uh, the ligand for our protein of interest, AKT here. And um, we also uh, uh, screened a variety of ligands for E3s, uh, but uh, ended up using VHL, which was turned out to be our most effective um, targeting agent. Um, we, uh, we basically uh, made a lot of different linkers and, to tr and, and different approaches to, to putting these molecules together. Uh, th this was all done in John Jin's lab. In our lab, uh, uh, Jia Zhu, who is the postdoc working on this in my lab, uh, basically his job was to initially just to screen the compounds uh, to see if they actually degraded AKT at all. Uh, and then, then for the best ones, um, do further deeper dives uh, into them. And so, um, uh, so the parent compound, just you'll see it over and over again uh, for the AKT kinase inhibitors, AZ5363, okay? And, the, and our degrader um, we call MS21. Uh, and that's, so you can see that here. And so the first, one of the first things we wanted to ask um, actually uh, was to see if these, uh, if a compound uh, was affecting um, binding to um, AKT. Uh, and so we, we did a screen to look for 
uh, the dissociation constant for binding of these uh, different degraders. And we made some control molecules that could either disrupt binding to the E3 or disrupt binding to AKT. And you can see quite easily that the, the, the molecule MS21N2 intended to disrupt binding to AKT is quite good at that. And you can also see that AZ5, uh, AZD5363, which is um, shown here in the black uh, dots, uh, has the highest affinity. And we take a hit in terms of affinity. Um, some for AKT1, not so much. Uh, AKT3 a little more and AKT2 the most, but not so bad as to now render these not functional in a physiologic setting because the, for instance, the worst setting here is we've dropped uh, MS21's KD now to uh, the sub-micromolar range, about 360 plus or minus um, uh, uh, is the KD nanomolar. So it's in the nanomolar range still. So anyway, um, we, we then um, set out to uh, test cell lines uh, for this degradation uh, function that was intended. And we could see that um, here's a cell line PC3. It's a, it's a P10 null, highly uh, AKT activated cell line uh, that's, um, th that where you can see that we were able to see a quite good uh, degradation. Uh, you can see here about 8.8 .8 nanomolar was the level that led to a 50% reduction in the protein. And um, we were seeing this over the um, a time course where you can see nice evidence of degradation by four hours. Uh, and you could also see um, a lowering of downstream signaling uh, a, a little bit later in the time course of like eight to 12 to, uh, to 24 hours. Uh, we also wanted to check out why or it was it working the way we intended it to. So we we mixed the MS21, the degrader molecule, which is shown here with DMSO, and we still got the effect. And then we asked all, all these other um, uh, molecules if they could uh, prevent um, degradation as expected. And these were a variety of uh, either uh, ligands um, or uh, inhibitors that affect um, uh, uh, ubiquitination or proteolysis. And so they all worked. And uh, probably the most important experiment that we did once we had this was to do some mass spec, uh, uh, some, you know, as, as best as possible, some unbiased with a nice clean tool, hopefully. Well, first we had to do two things. Once we needed to do this was to see if this was at off target effects. The kinase itself, um, when it was first reported, the kinase inhibitor uh, 5363 had a few um, uh, off target uh, effects uh, that were noted in the kinase screen. Uh, and so we wanted to see if we were degrading them, uh, uh, PKA being the principal one that we were concerned about. Um, and then uh, we also um, uh, wanted to see if there could be something new. And so you can see here, um, oh, this is one of several different mass spec experiments. As, as you well know, mass spec is not a, a quantitative in, in the sense that uh, it's not predictable what's gonna fly every experiment. So it's, it's, it's somewhat of an art, uh, but the trend is definitely your friend. And uh, we could always see, uh, in this case, we were able to see all AKT3, uh, all, all eight, three AKTs uh, were clearly degraded in the presence of MS21 versus the uh, non, um, uh, the, 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 the non, uh, uh, the control MS21N1, and that that was uh, really nice. But in most cases, we were seeing degradation of just one or two, actually two of three uh, AKTs. And here's an example of one of those experiments where we saw a degradation of two and three, uh, but not AKT1, uh, which was, uh, anyway. So what we did see also is two proteins that uh, were not AKT that seemed to reproducibly show up as outliers, uh, PDCD4, and aura kinase B. And PDCD4 is um, known in the literature to be uh, uh, regulated uh, by, uh, by AKT phosphorylation. So it's not surprising uh, that we saw it. So it was a nice validation that um, our degrader is working as, as expected. But aurora kinase B was one that we were not expecting and we thought could be potentially 
uh, you know, an off-target effect uh, of 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 um, of the degrader for AKT that we'd made. Uh, but to sort of figure that out, uh, we 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 thought, well, if um, this is an on-target uh, effect, we should see that it's regulated by um, uh, inhibition of the piatric kinase pathway through other uh, kinase inhibitors of AKT um, or um, uh, piatric kinase inhibitors uh, or uh, other um, other degraders. And we saw that it was able to lower all these different approaches lowered. Um, uh, uh, aurora kinase speed at various ex extents, which was, supports the idea that this is not an off-target effect of MS-21. It just hadn't been identified before and uh, potentially. And then we asked, well, is there potentially an AKT uh, regulation occurring uh, on aurora kinase speed that could explain um, this change in the protein level? And uh, that's, uh, we were able to use a scan site uh, an M MIT website to identify candidate phosphorylation site T73 on AKT. And uh, um, oops, I think I've got this out of order a little bit, but anyway, I'll get back to the um, that story later. But the other thing I wanted to point out to you is that we are here apparently having an effect on Aurora kinase B um, uh, uh, physiologically potentially in the uh, PC3 cells, because when we, um, uh, uh, treat the cells, and we did a flow analysis, we see a G2 uh, block and also an hyperploidy occurs here. And we know that uh, Aurora kinase B is involved in, um, in mitosis. It's a key kinase needed and required for proper my, uh, um, cell cycle movement through uh, mitosis in the cell cycle. So that was really um, uh, appealing. And, and here you can see... Um, this is a conserved a site uh, uh, for candidate AKT phosphorylation in a lot of species. Um, uh, however, we did not see it in, in, uh, in mouse and rat, but when we looked at other places in the mouse and rat, uh, we did find uh, they had a, a unique site that other species didn't have. So anyway, uh, we purchased some Aurora kinase B and we also purchased a Aurora kinase B inhibitor uh, baricertib. There's been several very potent, very high quality inhibitors of, of aurora kinase B, and baricertib seemed to be one of the best ones. So we we selected this, um, and also obviously we had the, the AKT kinase inhibitor here, and we basically simply um, uh, mixed the protein with ATP and uh, appropriate buffer, um, and also we um, we uh, 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 added. Um, uh, AKT uh, when we wanted to see what was happening. And the first thing we realized is that there seems to be some auto, and we were detecting this phosphorylation in vitro with a phospho substrate antibody we purchased from cell signaling. So that, unfortunately, at first, this was like, we we're like, uh-oh, we've got this big background band, but we were able to navigate that by purchasing this inhibitor of Aurora kinase B, which blocks the autophosphorylation of, of aurora kinase B. And then we were able to show that AKT in the setting of baricertib, which blocks the autophosphorylation, um, and AKT, now we could see the signal again. And that signal uh, then was also uh, reduced substantially if we add the AKT kinase inhibitor, showing that this was um, uh, likely to be a nice in vitro target uh, for um, our substrate uh, for AKT, aurora kinase B. Uh, of course, that's only in vitro, so we needed some supporting evidence. And I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time, all these data panels. Um, they're in our paper that was published uh, last uh, summer uh, in um, Cancer Discovery. But basically, what we saw was that um, insulin treatment uh, was able to stimulate the phosphorylation, uh, in this case, of a transfected aurora kinase B. Um, uh, and uh, if we made a mutation in this site, uh, we could not uh, see it um, with this signal. And then here, we could also uh, use uh, the AZ5363 uh, to inhibit. We could lower the signal in this setting. Uh, we also have uh, another, um, we use piatric kinase inhibitor to block it here. Uh, and, and also here, we were able to actually measure this on endogenous protein stimulated with insulin IP from PC3 cells and, and, and show that uh, we could block this phosphorylation with the kinase inhibitor. Uh, 
this is a minor point, but one of the questions that we asked was, uh, could, uh, since the phosphorylation site, the autophosphorylation site of Orochise B is a measure of its uh, activation, we wanted to know if potentially insulin was also activating uh, the autophosphorylation, and that did not seem to be the case uh, in, in either cell line that we looked at. Um, so the next thing we asked was, uh, was that, you know, is this site that we thought was um, important for potentially regulating the level of protein, if we made a phosphomimicking mutation, could we rescue uh, that degradation? And that's what we saw here with a mutation at this phosphorylation site to E, uh, we were able to maintain the protein level in the setting of MS21, uh, even though uh, we've lowered the AKT level uh, with the degradation of AKT. Uh, and then we also asked uh, here, um, is this occurring through, uh, this, this degradation uh, in cells occurring through proteasome mediated uh, degradation? And, uh, and we, we basically showed this by just showing, um, uh, you know, th this is the physiologic degradation uh, where we added a P3 kinase inhibitor, which should lower uh, uh, the level of, of, of um, aurora kinase B. And they wanted to see if we, if we block that with a proteasome inhibitor, MG132, would that work? And that, in fact, worked very nicely. And another thing that we noticed uh, is that uh, we saw what looked like uh, to be, um, uh, over long periods of time and treatment, more uh, durable uh, downregulation of targets. So here uh, uh, versus um, the five AZD5363 kinase inhibitor, where after you know, three days, you still have quite high level of AKT phosphorylation. The, the level of residual AKT and phosphorylation is very, very low compared to the kinase inhibitor. Aurora kinase B levels are lower uh, and PRAS40 levels are lower. This is in one of the cell lines we're looking at. Another cell line, this is a different panel, but it tells the same story. Uh, better uh, lowering of, of PRAS40, um, better lowering of phospho-S6, um, over, um, over many days of treatment. And then we wanted to ask, could Aurora Kinase B uh, rescue these cells from growth inhibition? So um, uh, the, uh, basically we, we'd already seen um, that um, when we added MS21 to PC3 cells, I hadn't shown this earlier, we got a nice growth inhibitory response in a dose responsive manner. This is a colony assay and that we, uh, if we uh, overexpress aurora kinase B um, or the E mutation or even the A mutation, because we're, we have higher levels of the protein, we see some level of rescue, um, uh, but with the best rescue uh, uh, seen with the um, E mutation. And this is just repeating this experiment uh, in other cell lines, uh, showing uh, that this is uh, reproducible. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is the vector expressing cells. Here's Aurora kinase B, a T73E cells. You can see the nice partial rescue here, just overexpression Aurora kinase B. Part, uh, not as much of a partial rescue, not as good of a rescue. And here, um, another cell line, BT549, similar story. Um, so um, now I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit and, and talk about, um, you know, uh, trying to understand how uh, how this drug MS21 inhibits the growth of uh, tumor cells, uh, first in vitro and then in vivo, uh, 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 in terms of in what setting does it work? And this is just two different cell lines, um, two P10 mutant cell lines that behave quite similarly in many ways where the degrader worked better uh, than the parent compound um, in both settings. That wasn't always the case. Sometimes they were equivalent but I just want to highlight these two. And this was associated with an increase in cell death uh, with the degrader that wasn't seen with the kinase inhibitor. This, um, these two cell lines uh, differed in their ability to degrade um, uh, AKT. So I showed you earlier the data on PC3 where it had a DC50 of around eight. Here it's about tenfold higher. Uh, and what we did, again, to, to make a long story short, is we, we noticed that there was just um, higher levels of VHL in PC3 than, MC, uh, and than MDA468 cells. 
Uh, we also saw this by um, uh, here on the right by RPPA data, uh, where we saw VHL levels were lower. So, um, and 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 I um, we we also did an experiment where we asked whether or not um, if we overexpressed a VHL in these cells, could that actually uh, lead to better degradation? And that was the case. Uh, and um, and this was uh, the effect uh, it had on these cells. You can see nice colony suppression improved over the uh, um, the kinase inhibitor. Anyway, we tested out this, uh, this uh, drug in mice. We were able to deliver it uh, intraperitoneally with good um, PK and uh, uh, properties, a uh, fairly long half-life uh, in the body here and uh, of the mice. And then we, uh, we saw on the right here uh, that we could effectively block tumor progression uh, when they were transplanted better and more effectively than, um, than the kinase inhibitor. Uh, and this, this experiment um, uh, was uh, basically uh, um, done on PC3 cells initially. So that, that was the, one of the lines where we saw really good degradation. And you can see here, we're seeing degradation. Now there's still protein here. Not exactly sure the source of this protein. It could be mouse protein because obviously a xenografted tumor has blood vessels, fibroblasts, and stroma of other kinds uh, in there. Um, so, uh, uh, but th that's certainly seeing degradation and we're seeing lowering of phospho-AKT quite nicely uh, and uh, phospho-PRAS40. Um, and uh, basically we could see by IHC also lowering of AKT levels uh, that were quite clear. Uh, another experiment that we did was we wanted to see how this affected uh, the drug um, uh, affected, MS21 affected uh, blood glucose in mice. It's, it's well known that PSV kinase inhibitors uh, cause a very high spike in, in, in glucose higher than this. And it's also known that AZD5363, AKT kinase inhibitor, has some effect on blood glucose uh, levels, uh, not to the same extent as seen uh, in, in, in patients um, with the PSV kinase inhibitors. And so we wanted to, to compare ourselves to AZD5363, and we saw a, an increase in blood glucose. This was very positive news because it would suggest that this is in the manageable range uh, of, of glucose uh, change uh, and, and occurs um, and it can be easily treated medically. Uh, okay, so this then gets to really the heart of, of the title of my lecture. Um, and, um, and this is sort of the end uh, part of the lecture. And just bear with me as I go through this data. What we did was we, we put together a panel of 38 cancer cell lines. And uh, we wanted half of that deck of cell lines to have a mutation on the pediatric kinase pathway, and we wanted half of it not to have that. And the reason we put this deck together is we were, it was to test the hypothesis that potentially the degrader could preferentially inhibit the growth of mutant pediatric kinase pathway, P10 pathway mutant cell lines and not wild type ones. And the reason we thought that is prior work with uh, in cell lines from um, from uh, uh, AstraZeneca on this cell line and on uh, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, GSK uh, on their AKT kinase inhibitors, which we hadn't studied, but, and also from Genentech had reported this relatively increased sensitivity uh, in cell lines that were mutant for the pathway for AKT kinase inhibitors. So we were, we were wondering, and since we'd seen those two cell lines I showed you earlier, uh, where uh, the degrader was better um, in, uh, than, than the kinase inhibitor in, in two lines, we thought, well, maybe we should look more, more broadly and see if this trend was something that was real. And so what I'm gonna show you is basically the work of, of, of a lot of these colony forming assays, uh, which had been quantified. And this is the genotypes of the cell lines uh, that we uh, we were working with. Uh, and you can see that sensitivity does in fact correlate with PIK3CA uh, mutations. You see a lot of PIK3CA mutations, P10 mutations, HER2 amplification, which is a strong activator of PIK3CA. And this, uh, and in this case, um, a one um, AKT1 amplification. But what's interesting about these sensitive lines is the red uh, asterisks. So these lines were sensitive to the degrader, but not sensitive to the kinase inhibitor. Uh, 
The ones that don't have an asterisk were sensitive to both the kinase inhibitor and the degrader. And on this left side, we were seeing resistance that was driven a lot by RAS and BRAF, apparently. And uh, we did have cell lines with uh, PIK3CA mutations or P10 mutations. Uh, um, here's another pic 3 ca mutate or AKT or HERT, but they tended with just one exception to always overlap a KRAS or BRAF mutant cell line. And the one exception was uh, U87, which is a glioblastoma cell line. Uh, on, the, on the sensitive side, all the sensitive cell lines had a mutation in the pathway of one kind or the other, with the exception of this one line, BXPC3, which has a BRAF mutation. And we can't really explain why this is sensitive to um, uh, the, the, the AKT degrader. And this is just some of the, the raw data showing you um, sensitive or MS21 are in the black lines and the gray lines are, are the kinase inhibitor and, and showing the resistant lines um, where you know, they all tend to be resistant, right? And this is just some of the odds ratios calculated based on genotype where we're seeing very high odds ratios of inhibiting uh, cell lines with a pediatric kinase pathway alteration um, or uh, a not having a RAS pathway alteration or uh, one without the other. Uh, and so that, that, that's just documented there. And, um, and we then wanted to explore this in more depth. Why were we seeing this? Um, what was the reason for this? And, and basically the resistant lines are again in, in red and the um, sensitive lines here are in blue. And this just showing that we're degrading all three forms of AKT nicely as expected in PC3. And here's another line where that's the case. But these resistant lines by and large tended to be ones where we just weren't degrading AKT very well. And it appeared using um, a SESTA assay um, where uh, that, um, that these resistant lines appeared not to be binding um, MS21 uh, ligand, AZD5363 was not binding as well uh, the AKT ligand, right, uh, was not binding as well in these mutant cell lines. Um, but one thing that we noticed also uh, was that uh, the phosphorylation of AKT tended to be higher in these sensitive cell lines. And we can see this here um, in some RPPA data. Uh, and there were some exceptions, again, um, as I, I mentioned earlier, but that was definitely uh, uh, happening. Uh, and so we, we, we wanted to ask, whether or not um, potentially this could be uh, something that was simply a, 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 an effect of the phosphorylation status of AKT. So we treated cells with either IGF or insulin and other data, and we could see that the treatment uh, actually could stimulate degradation. And then we used trametinib, which is known, shown here, and this we confirmed, to upregulate uh, phosphorylation of, of AKT over a long time course through a feedback loop. That I won't get into, um, and then showed that we could actually improve degradation of AKT when we combined trametinib, which increased the phosphorylation of AKT, with MS21, which was uh, quite heartening. Obviously, we're going to shut off ERK with trametinib, uh, as that is a, a MEK inhibitor. And then we uh, finally, the last uh, major piece of data, of the, at least uh, cell based data, is shown here where we saw. And these are some uh, cell lines that were uh, resistant uh, to um, uh, this HT29 colorectal cell line. Um, here's HPAF11 cells. These cell lines um, had double mutations on both pathways, on, on the RAS and pediatric kinase pathway. They were resistant to MS21 and uh, partially resistant to trametinib. We could see quite nice colony inhibition uh, 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 in combination, sort of overcoming the resistance. Um, and we, we saw a similar trend in two other cell lines here with double mutations. Here we had to use a slightly higher dose of trametinib to see this combination effect work well. But anyway, we, we saw a really nice uh, effect of combination here with the trametinib and the degrader. Anyway, um, we're just going to finish up with one of the last figures in the paper uh, where we uh, basically found uh, looking at doing a pan cancer analysis. This is one of uh, the postdocs in my lab that's a bioinformatician, uh, and she identified uh, that in uh, out of all these uh, thousands and thousands of uh, cases of cancer, about 19% uh, have a, a PI3 kinase uh, mutation or P10 pathway mutation. Um, 
uh, uh, and and you can see the frequency of uh, RAS mutant pathways and double uh, both pathways being mutated. So quite a nice uh, group of potential patients that could potentially benefit from this. So here's a summary um, of the talk. Uh, I think we developed a first in class because uh, it was the first uh, BHL based degrader um, published and selective small molecule um, degrader MS21 and characterized it in a battery of biochemical cellular and in vivo assays found that it was superior MS21 to the kinase inhibitor for inhibiting the proliferation of P kinase P10 pathway mutant tumor cell lines in vitro and in vivo. Uh, we had additional in vivo data for another cell line I didn't show. Um, we found that Aurora kinase B is a substrate for AKT and it's downstream and it's down regulation contributes to MS21 inhibition effect. And we found that VHL expression level is an important factor affecting the effectiveness of VHL recruitment uh, recruiting AKT degraders. Resistance to MS21 was identified in cancer lines containing KRAS or BRAF gene mutations, regardless of the presence of HER2, PIK3CAP10, and AKT alterations. And because we know that uh, we have double um, mutants and they're resistant, we still don't completely understand that mechanism of resistance. And it's, it's an interesting topic that we're looking into. Um, and resistance to MS21 could be overcome when both pathways um, or only KRAS was mutated um, uh, by combining, I didn't show that data, but we also saw that as well, by combining MEK inhibitors with MS21, uh, which only inhibited MEK, but also increased AKT phosphorylation and improved AKT degra degradation. And finally, a large percentage of cancer cells have a genotype that could benefit from AKT degradation therapy. Um, anyway, that's um, the uh, end of my uh, presentation. Um, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll just try to stop sharing. Um, and uh, it worked. Thank you so much, Raymond. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Questions, everybody. Maybe let me start with one. Um, there was by, you know, Pandolfi had a paper a few years back sh showing activating basically dominant negative versus of P10. Uh, is anybody following up on those? And what role do they play in actual patients? And can that be targeted as well? Um, you, you know, we haven't really followed that work uh, since it came out. I, I mean, our, our findings are, um, we typically find in the experiments we've done, um, and it depends on the assay you use. So you have to be careful. Uh, we typically have found that um, in a lot of readouts, if we just mutate the phosphatase domain, um, which, you know, basically keeps the protein intact and acts like it can act as a dominant negative potentially. Right. But we typically don't see a lot of the readouts that we're, we're, we're studying. Like I didn't show you, but these colony assays um, are, are basically uh, driven by um, the phosphatase activity of P10. So if I put in a phosphatase dead version of P10, um, the colonies are the same as if I didn't put any P10 at all. The cells might not migrate as well, or they may not uh, um, have other features. Maybe their DNA repair pathways may be somewhat altered because uh, there are lots of things that P10 does that are not catalytic. But in terms of growth suppression and tumor suppression, I, I, I think our data would pretty strongly indicate that that's the key thing that we're, we're looking at is this phosphatase activity. All right, there is a question by somebody, uh, by Vicky Zellen, and she asked uh, about her sister who has uterine leiomyosarcoma and she has P10 loss and P53 N31, 131 deletion. Do you ever study P10 in rare cancers? Um, I, you know, I, um, that's a really interesting. My, my aunt died of a very rare a mixed sarcoma uh, uh, epithelial tumor of the uterus. Um, and uh, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Um, and, um, but usually what we end up doing is we use tools that we find accessible to us um, and would love to work on these different rare diseases, but often uh, because they're rare, uh, the tools for studying them are not as, as, as good. Um, but I, I would, uh, the, the data in endometrial cancer for P10, it's one of the most commonly mutated uh, genes in, in, in all, in many different forms of endometrial cancer. And uh, obviously 
uh, the serous form, it's a, mostly a P53 driven disease, but um, I would say that, um, uh, you know, uh, hopefully one day we'll have uh, clinical trials available uh, for targeted therapy uh, for P10 mutant cancers, whether it be uh, a degrader. Uh, we also have published um, uh, papers um, finding synthetic lethal interactions as have others for P10 loss. We, we particularly uh, think that um, uh, leflunamide, which is a DHODH inhibitor that blocks um, the de novo synthesis of pyrimidines is a synthetic lethal target for P10 loss. And we have a clinical trial that's uh, open here for triple negative breast cancer with leflunamide. And we're about to open a clinical trial here on leflunamide uh, for P10 negative cancer for all comers. Um, uh, those kinds of trials, the, the second trial, a basket trial focused on the target uh, may be a good way to try to uh, be inclusive for rare cancers uh, in terms of, of trying to actually see if there's a benefit. Um, but um, as you know, with rare cancers, uh, it's hard to design uh, trials for rare cancers uh, because they're rare. Um, I hope that answers your question. Hope so too. I mean, follow up, following up on that, I mean, your effects with your MS-21 looked rather dramatic, at least in the PC3 model. Have you used them in uh, immune-competent mice? In, in spontaneous models of cancer? Uh, that is a really good question, Marcus. I, we, right now, um, I would love to have, but we, we um, so far we have not. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I'll let everybody in my lab know that you asked that question because it's something- <laughs> I'm sure they asked, in the, they asked the same question. <laughs> All right, uh, Jin, Jin Dang has a, has a question. Yes. Hi, uh, Raymond, a great talk and congratulations in finding such a great protect. Um, so I noticed that you use a PC3, which is like a new endocrine like prostate cancer. And uh, in new endocrine prostate cancer, there's a high expression of oral kinase A you know, as a therapeutic target. So does AKT or your, your PROTEC in S21 um, target or reduce oral kinase A activity as well, or just oral kinase B? And yeah. did you test that compound in the NEPC, like PDX models? Yeah, we we looked at Aurora kinase A. Uh, I'm just going to uh, basically show you one thing I want to just say before I answer that question is I like I just wanted to hurry up. I felt like I was running late, but I have got to uh, acknowledge all the collaborators uh, on this uh, on this uh, project. Basically, uh, this is a photograph of the lab of, of my lab uh, in our building uh, pre COVID. Um, and um, this collaboration was like really important. Uh, that uh, we worked with Jianjin. I mentioned that during the talk, but uh, 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 Fen Yu, who is the postdoc that synthesized the molecules, was critical. Our work with uh, Pulikos Pulikakos, uh, who helped us understand how to use the MEK inhibitor, uh, and uh, his postdoc was really, really important. And also just really a lot of this work was spearheaded by postdoc in my, my lab, Zhu, who um, who's on the job market right now uh, and getting uh, lots of interviews um, and uh, um, uh, based on this project. So anyway, so, sorry to uh, uh, stop <laughs> in the middle of my name question, reminded but... you of that. So my name is something good. <laughs> yeah, so so, but basically um, I, I wanted to uh, basically say that Aurora, Aurora Kinase A is a really good target and um, uh, for cancer, I think, but we just don't seem to be affecting it. Um, I mean, we can affect it from the point of view of the cell cycle, we think, but we're not seeing the same level of, of degradation. And, and Aurora kinase A does not have a phosphorylation signal uh, that we saw at least. And then also um, we didn't see it in our, in our mass spec data showing up. So for those reasons, um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't think it's a target of this, Thank but you, we Mike. may be wrong. I, I, I could be staying corrected. <laughs> yeah, I thought you could save a lot of patients with the new endocrine prostate cancer. Yeah, thank you. All right, any other questions? If not, I'd like to thank Raymond for a fantastic talk and everybody for attending. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks uh, for coming. Thanks for visiting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> it's a real honor. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.